All right, welcome to the show today. My guest today is Chris Ridd. He's a business executive, investor and advisor with 30 years experience in the technology industry. After a long career with Microsoft spanning 15 years, he was appointed managing director for Zero in Australia to lead the expansion of Zero's market share in Australia. Under his leadership, Zero grew in five years from seven staff and four and a half thousand customers to 270 staff and 320,000 paying customers. Today, Chris has taken his vast experience and applied it as an investor and advisor in a number of exciting Australian startups. I want to bring Chris on the show to find out what he's learned from such a wide ranging career working in challenging and high performance environments, how he thinks about investing and what's next for him. So Chris, welcome to the show. Thank you, James, good to be here. Of course. So I'd love to start a little bit on your background and your story and just maybe you could take us through the early stage of, you, of your career and how you got into technology. Sure. Uh, well, I mean, it sort of started um, at university, uh, had a, um, a great lecture. I, I started in accounting, funnily enough, because I ended up in accounting with zero and I didn't like accounting. Um, but I had this great lecturer, uh, this guy Peter, who um, early on sort of in, the, uh, in that sort of journey... Um, Felt I had some good skills around, uh, you know, people skills and said, hey, you know, you'd be really good in sales one day. And I thought, at my perception of sales back then, like a lot of young people, is, oh, I don't really like sales. It sounds, you know... Cheap suit. Yeah, it off used sort cars. of used car salesman type thing. But <clears throat> what I began to realise was that actually starting in sales, if you actually look at where a lot of CEOs, you know, come from, a lot of it's about customer facing and really understanding uh, how to generate revenue for an organisation. And, and this was all the stuff I was learning there. So I thought, look, it would be pretty good to do that. So I ended up... Uh, jumping streams and getting into um, marketing. So I did economics marketing. But my real passion through that, because <clears throat> you're going back, I mean, it was like 1986, right? So the PC was only three years old. Wow. So <clears throat> tech was very new, but I had a real passion for technology. So, um, you know, one of the funny stories going through uni was um, we did this subject called Introduction to Data Processing, which is so boring. Uh, so it wasn't really, you know, that sort of sexy, uh, sexy brands around technology and so forth. But... Um, um, and I, I took copious notes, so I actually sold a lot of the notes I took because no one was interested in the subject. So when it came exam time, they were all coming to me, so I was selling my notes for five bucks a pop. It was wow. pretty funny. <laughs> but, um, but I did really enjoy that. And so I had that kind of early uh, passion for sales marketing, uh, but also technology. And so that led me into starting with a company called NCR, which was one of the big kind of um, big pack of tech companies that were doing graduate um, uh, programs. And started with them back in 1989, mm -hmm. uh, and then that's sort of where my career went. So, um, Amazing. so spent six and a half years there, and then of course Microsoft. Yeah, I'd love to hear a bit about your time at Microsoft. So, how did that come about, and I guess what was your progression through that organisation? Yeah, look, I was I was actually working in the US. Um, I went over there on a three months secondment, ended up staying a year with NCR, um, and they. Um, so that was a fabulous opportunity. And what I was doing, I was, I was doing executive visits to one of their development facilities. So uh, you had sales teams that would bring customers over and we would run two day events typically or day event uh, to close big sales. So I used to organise a lot of that. So it would be a matter of understanding, you know, what we were pitching and so forth. And in those days, um, Windows NT had just launched and, they, and, and so NCR had a range of um, mid-range platforms uh, on NT 4.0 or whatever it was back then. And um, so I got exposed to what Microsoft was doing from a technology front when I was in the US. And it was really interesting. When I came back, NCR had this Microsoft large account reseller program that they had no, no idea what to do with. So they said, well, why don't you run that? And it ended up being quite successful. We, we, we built a number of different service offerings off the back of that program. Um, and of course, in doing that, I got to know the local team at Microsoft and they turned around and said, look, we really like what you got, what you do. And they offered me an account manager role. Uh, so that was back in 1996, uh, 95. Um, so that's when I started at Microsoft in 95, which was really an exciting time in the industry. Microsoft was the disruptor at that time. You know, you had IBM and NCR and another, a, a range of other um, mid-range companies, Pyramid, that were doing mid-range Unix systems. And Microsoft had come out with Windows NT, trying to disrupt that sort of low end of the market and doing very well, and then started building back office and a whole lot of other platforms, Microsoft Exchange. And so it was a really cool time to join because there was so much innovation and Microsoft was going from strength to strength. Yep. Um, and uh, so that's where I cut my teeth really in, you know, in a, um, 
in terms of the sales role and then sort of moved on from there. Yeah, it sounds like it was a, you progressed well through the organization. You got to meet Bill Gates at one point, I saw. Yes. <laughs> which I'm curious what he was like yeah. <laughs> to meet. <laughs> yeah, he's odd. Um, <laughs> I can believe it. I mean, you know, inc- incredibly intelligent. and uh, But, you know, yeah, I mean, we can talk about that. But, yeah, yeah no, yeah. it's quite a, quite a milestone. <laughs> so, yeah, you sort of started off as an account manager and then, you know, we're doing sales business development. And then yeah. I think you headed up the enterprise business in Victoria, grew that. I'm just curious, like, what do you put your success at Microsoft down to? Like, is there anything you can think of specifically that allowed you to kind of progress well through that organization? Um, look, I, it's a good question. I, I wasn't really sure. If, if I step back and look at the long-term vision of what I wanted to do, <clears throat> I didn't really have a clear vision. I was certainly, I was ambitious to the point where Every gig that I jumped into, I really wanted to do it the best that I possibly could. Um, and I think that was motivated probably through fear of failure, if anything. <laughs> um, and, uh, but I was really, I enjoyed everything I did at Microsoft. Uh, incredible organisation, you know, I, I liken it to doing a couple of MBAs because you learnt so much and they really did throw you in the deep end. So the amount of times that I would come into a role and it was really, you had a lot of autonomy. I mean, as things got bigger, things were slower and it was a bit more bureaucratic and so on. But, but you know, reflecting back, I think they did give you a lot of um, leeway to, to get in and actually do things um, and make decisions and take risks. Um, and to a large extent, that culture had changed by the time I left, which is one of the reasons I left. But, um, but looking back, you know, I was there for 15 years. I didn't plan to be. Yeah. And I think one of the things I, I was conscious of through... Um, probably about two thirds of the way through that was ensuring that I had a range of experiences. You know, I jumped into a marketing role because I I, I hadn't done marketing. I'd been in sales and then I jumped back into sales management. Um, In fact, I even demoted myself at one point to focus on sales management because I'd been promoted quite quickly and was not comfortable where I was actually sitting. Some of my peers had years of experience in sales management. Here I was basically telling them what to do. So I was really uncomfortable with that. But um, but in the long run, it, it worked out really well. I had a, you know, I did marketing. I did, you know, I was involved in channel. I was involved in product. I, you know, in my last role there, I was running a division which was, you know, product channel, the whole, you know, marketing, sales, the whole, whole lot. And I think that really set me up for the next stage, which was zero, to actually run a company. Um, probably wasn't as deliberate as it sounds, but you know, I knew that um, it was probably just fear of boredom more than anything that sort of allowed me to jump into different roles. Um, and then l- reflecting back, you know, I was, I was really ready for something like Zero by the time that opportunity arose. Yeah, right. It's an amazing, amazing journey through mm-hmm. Microsoft. And I was just curious as well, do you think, because you kind of, nowadays you're more involved in startups and I guess smaller businesses in that high growth stage. But yep. do you think starting at a large corporation like Microsoft gave you a solid foundation for what you're doing today? Do you think that's a pretty good path for a lot of people to go on? Oh, no doubt. Um, uh, there is no doubt about that. I think um, the, you know, when I approach opportunities now, like sometimes I get asked to, you know, um, look at a, you know, for one of the tech startups I'm involved in, they wanted to build out a customer success function. Mm. And so, you know, the starting point for me was going back and really understanding the customer journey and looking at all the interactions. And, and it becomes quite an analytical process where you pick it apart and really understand what you're trying to build. All of that experience came from Microsoft. They were incredibly um, precise in terms of the way they wanted to build something. You know, my first um, experience of that was back in 1998. I came out of sales, and I was put into a program role where, you know, if you think about it, it's so obvious now. But back in 1998, we didn't. We had one sales model. We were selling. You know, salespeople go out and meet an account. You know, and typically those accounts were large. And as we started to really grow and expand. There was no concept of a tier two sales model where you're saying, well, actually, we might, we might want to implement telesales mm. and do things more at scale rather than having, you know, one sales rep trying to manage 50 accounts. Mm. Maybe or you can do that, but what are all the systems and processes and other resources, you know, pre-sales and other things you need to consider to do that at scale, mm. given that your, you know, your average contract value is decreasing, so you can't justify, you know, just putting on more and more salespeople. So I went to the US and there had been a lot of work done in actually modelling out how to build a tier two sales you know, model. Um, and that was fascinating for me. It was just like, God, there's so much analytical thinking going into how we want to build this out. Mm. And then I came back and implemented it. Mm. And so that was an awesome experience. And I think so definitely Microsoft taught me the importance of understanding process and understanding data yeah. 
and applying that to then building models that you know allowed you to scale and definitely a lot of that came into play particularly at zero but all the stuff i do now i often reflect about you know hmm, what would i do if this was microsoft yeah <laughs> i get it so that's very cool that's awesome yeah so why did you end up leaving microsoft what happened next for you in your career look I, I, this is a story i've told a number of times but um look i was just unhappy and <clears throat> i think the source of that unhappiness came from a number of different places um I still remember the day, it was back in August 2010, I was in a meeting and um, you know, I was part of a, a management team that uh, was running different parts of a business and you know, it was quite a large business, it was a whole sort of mid-market and everything. And, um, and I just sort of had this overwhelming feeling, there's a lot going on in my life and I'm thinking, you know, I'm just fundamentally not happy with what I'm doing at work. Um, and you know, I, I, I got back to the hotel that night and just thought, you know, do I want to continue? Because I had a I had a great career there. My my next yeah. role at Microsoft would have been on the senior leadership team, the SLT, which you know um, was was a comfortable position. And I think a lot of people, perhaps listening to the podcast, you get in these corporate roles, and they are comfortable. I mean, yeah. yes, there's pressure, and yes, you know, you've got targets hit and everything. But at the end of the day, um, compared to the world of entrepreneurs and startups, they're kind of safe environments, and I felt safe. And one thing about my career that I would probably reflect on 30 years, I've never been really good at safe. <laughs> you know, I've, I've always sort of, even at Microsoft, I kept jumping around and doing different things. And I got to the point where it really did amount to me being fundamentally unhappy. Wow. And um, interesting, so this, this is funny. So on, the, on that night, I thought, I've got to do something about this. I don't want to die I as a corporate soldier. <laughs> I need to have a crack. And I, the interesting thing about all the work I'd been doing in the previous few years was I was in and around, in fact, previous 10, 15 years, I had seen um, guys and girls that would leave corporate and build these small you know, uh, companies that were part of the Microsoft ecosystem and build them successfully and do really well. You know, build up these businesses and, and I could name many um, and, and be very successful and exit and, you know, and I thought, well, I know I could do that. Yeah. I know I could do something smaller. It's probably gonna be more fun. I don't have all the rules and bullshit that goes with corporate. Um, and I've got a lot of skills and if I don't have a crack now, I was 42, 43, 42, yeah. I've got to do it now. So um, anyway, so then the next day I had to fly back to Melbourne. I was at the airport, storms came through, flights delayed five hours. What am I going to do? I made phone calls. So I started ringing people in my network that were not part of Microsoft that I knew. I made six phone calls and said, I'm going to leave Microsoft. And of those six phone calls, I had three job opportunities. Mm -hmm. You know, I had one guy who was like, you know, said to him, hey, look, you know, I'm going to leave Microsoft. He goes, oh, about time. And I <laughs> said, um, he said, oh, he said, don't tell anyone, but, you know, because he was running a, a services company. He said, you know, um, you know, I'm going to move to New York and I need someone to run it. Uh, you'd be perfect. And, you know, why don't we have a chat? I said, great. You know, the next phone call was like, oh, actually, you know, I know some, such and such who's building this business. They're actually looking for someone to run it. Like, it's really exciting. Anyway, none of those opportunities came through, but it gave me the confidence when I got home on that Friday night. I said to my wife, I'm resigning from Microsoft. She goes, oh, what, you got a job? And I said, no. <laughs> but I said, I've just had a really interesting day where I'm just going to back myself in here. Yeah. You know, fuck it. I'm just going to, I'm going to leave because if I stay, I'm miserable and I'm going to have a crack. And that's what happened. And I think, you know, that's a really good lesson. You know, you put yourself out there, you have a crack and funny things happen. And, and then the next thing that came across, you know, my desk was zero. Yeah. So. That's amazing. Mm. I love it. Having a crack. So... Yeah, so the, your next next stage of your career was at Zero, yep. where you got brought in as the managing director for Australia. So, I'm just curious, yeah, what was that transition like coming from from Microsoft and going into what was at the time a very small kind of startup in Australia? So maybe if you could talk about that transition. Yeah, look, it was it was strange. Um, it was really it was really fun though. Um, you know, it was, it was a big learning curve, you know, because I had the safety net of corporate, you know, if I wanted to hire people when I was at Microsoft, I had HR and a recruitment team and pick up the phone and next thing I got to recruit in my office and I'd brief them, this is the role I'm looking for, they go and find candidates and it was all, everything was just, you know, I had resources on tap. Um, and at zero, when I had to hire people, it was like, you know, I've heard of this thing called Seek. <laughs> and I ended up getting some weird, weird, you know, um, candidates coming through Seek and then I'd so I was ringing my mates going, you know, who are running these other smaller companies. Who do you use for recruitment? So, so you've got to figure it out. Same with, you know, I remember, um, I've got to be careful, I won't mention any names just to sort of protect the, or the guilty. Um, but, um, but I got a rude letter from one of our competitors early on because we had all this information on our website about how Zero was better than the competition and, 
And to be honest, some of it wasn't entirely accurate. <laughs> <laughs> and so I get this really long letter from one of the lawyers representing one of our competitors saying, you know, we're going to sue you and all this. I was like, shit, what do I do here? Yeah. So I, and I don't think Rod would mind me saying this because they're all, we're A6 listed now and it's all, you know, very serious. But back in the day, and Rod just said, oh, screw it, mate. They're just, you know, they can go to hell. And I said, no, 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 no we can't do that, right? So um, my sister-in-law is a lawyer in intellectual property. So on a Sunday afternoon, I go around to her place, sitting over a kitchen table. She drafts a response. Right? This is the sort of stuff startups do, right? Yeah. And, um, and look, that was, in some ways it was scary, but I was so um, uh, energised by the fact that you were just making this shit up as we go. Yeah. And it was a lot of fun, you know, taking the rubbish out on a Wednesday because there was no one to do it. I had two couples in the office that were cleaning on week weekends. I didn't find out that they were actually cleaning the office on weekends until about six weeks in the job. And they're going, oh, we're going to come in on Saturday and clean. I'm going, oh, guys, surely. I mean, because the thing people don't know, Zero's flush with money now. But back in the day, we were pushing to break even by end of 2011. So we're watching every dollar. Yeah. And they're coming in on weekends to clean, to save on cleaning. Because I said, come on, guys. <laughs> I said, I know we're a startup, but this is ridiculous. You're not going to clean the office, so we got a cleaner. <laughs> but, um, but you know, that, it was energising. It, um, it was scary at times, but it was just a lot of fun. I actually drive past that old office. It was 100 square metres. We had seven staff. <laughs> and I, I smile every time I drive past that office in, in Richmond, in Bridge Road, because I think about all the things that, those early days of just, you know, not knowing what was ahead, not knowing this is going to be, become like a global brand. Mm. And you're working towards that and it was exciting. So that was, and that was a drug that, you know, I haven't been able to give up since, right? <laughs> Getting involved in startups where you, you can see the potential. They don't all work. They're pretty, bloody hard. Yeah. But when they do, it's so cool, you know, yeah. when you overcome some of those obstacles. And, and that, that's the thing that kind of, you know, at that time I thought, geez, I wish I'd done it earlier, but, you know, I'm glad I did it. At least I did it. Yeah. And my message to a lot of people listening to the podcast that are in corporates, you got some awesome skills. Um, and I know it's hard to take that risk because I had three mortgages when I left and took a 50% pay cut. Yeah. So they're not easy decisions financially. But I reckon, you, you know, uh, you know, it's, it's a lot of fun. You owe it to yourself to sort of take a punt. Yeah. Because you can always go back, I guess. Well, that's it. And that's the thing people, a lot of people forget. You can't go back a lot of the times. You can. And I think it's... it's I admire the fact that you did that at 42 when you had three mortgages and yeah. you sort of took that jump because I think there's a lot of people who are like 21 and have no responsibilities and still find it hard to <laughs> take yeah. some sort of leap. So the fact I, that you did that. I mean, look, I, I couldn't have done it when I was much younger. I mean, I, I mix with entrepreneurs now, you know, one in particular with one of the ones I'm involved in. He's only 30. And I look at him and go, shit, when I was 30, I, <laughs> I knew jack shit. Really. <laughs> I mean, I didn't have the skills I have now. Yeah. Um, and, and I knew I needed to jump around about that time, you know, 42 um, was, you know, um, I remember Rod Drury saying to me when we met and we got along like a house on fire and he just said, look, you need to come over to New Zealand and meet the team because on paper you are a scary proposition for us. We're a fast moving entrepreneurial startup and you're a 15 year veteran of Microsoft. You look institutionalised on paper, <laughs> right? So he said, and he said, I can see you're not that sort of person. So come over and just, you know, help you know calm the troops and make sure we're not hiring some you know corporate psycho yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so so and that w it was a really good point in fact steve vamos who's now running zero he was at microsoft he was the md at the time i remember he was my mentor and back when i was at about the 10 year mark i was in his office he shut the door and he goes when are you leaving microsoft and wow. i was like what are you talking about that's so disloyal you can't say that and he's going well of course i can he said it's about you mm. i mean you got to continue to evolve and you've got so much to offer and there's a time when your tenure becomes a liability. And right now, looking at you, you know, 10 years at Microsoft, you know, if you're gonna do something next, right, now's the time to think about it. And that really stuck with me. It was like, actually, it's a really good point. Now, I tried to leave. I didn't plan to stay for 15 years. Yeah. And there were a couple of moments, you know, during that next sort of five year stint where I was looking around thinking, Steve's right, you know, um, do I have the burning fire in my belly that I had when I started at Microsoft? No, I don't. Am I feeling in a safe environment, being well paid and kind of, you know, going through the motions on some days? Absolutely. Mm. And I didn't want to be like that. So makes sense. So I had to in the end I had to leave without anything to go to. That was a massive risk. But it was one I was just it was either do that or die a corporate soldier and be miserable. Yeah. <laughs> I mean it's a first world problem. Come on. I mean Microsoft <laughs> was good. I don't I don't want anyone to sit here and think that was a bad place nah, to work. Because I, I mean it. shit if I'd stayed there. Actually the one thing I'd say 
I left when the share price was 24 bucks. It's now 165. So <laughs> wait, and, and when I left Zero, Zero was $16. It's now 86. So my tip, my finance, uh, my investment tip for anyone listening to this podcast is wait until Chris Ridd leaves an organization, <laughs> then buy shares, <laughs> right? Because it goes nuts. Mind you, I'm still a Zero shareholder. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, anyway, it was, it was more about picking the time that was right for me to leave, even though I didn't have anything to move to. Got it. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah I love that. And so in those early days of zero, I guess, how did you even know where to start and what to work on like in terms of growing that business? Like, how did you really wrap your head around? That? Look, I mean, in fairness, <clears throat> there were some smart people. Um, New Zealand had proven the, the market, right? I mean, <clears throat> you talk about product market fit. I work with startups now where sometimes you go, you know what, I don't think we've really quite nailed product market fit, right? And then other times you, you do. And Zero was a good example where they'd proven the model in New Zealand. And I guess one of the things that attracted Rod to me uh, was the fact that I had scaled businesses. I'd worked in a big organisation. So I knew, I knew a lot of things to do mm. in terms of building the team. So even though I'd never run a team of 270 people, and there were checkpoints along that journey, you know, where we had growth spurts and I had to sort of check and go, shit, I'm now running a 100 people, 150, mm. 200, you know. Um, but I'd seen that in the corporate sense. I think, um, so that experience really helped yeah. um, drive that. But, you know, there was a lot of um, the model about how to, to build, um, you know, the sales model had been proven. There were a lot of things we figured out though, you know, yeah. um, like product in particular. Um, Zero had no payroll. We knew, I knew very early on that without payroll, Zero was never going to, you know, we were a distant number three or four at that time. So if we wanted to be number two or one, we had to have payroll, had to have a few things. And then there were some innovative things that we did around the channel program partners and working with accountants and the marketing, go to market, all those things. They were really good fun. And there was stuff that I'd, a lot of that I'd done at Microsoft. So it was really just pulling out the playbook, doing things a little bit differently. Mm. But, you know, um, and of course, you know, capital helps, having money. Yeah. You know, I mentioned in that first year, my first board meeting in would have been about April. Um, I went over there and said, oh my God, you know, like, I've got MIB has got 70% market share. They've got like scores of salespeople. I've got two. <laughs> and they go, what do you need? And I said, well, I, I at least need another couple of salespeople, <laughs> you know? It's really hard. You know, we've got no representation in most of the states. So, so you know, I got a couple of heads. And then it was June of that year where everything changed because um, Zero had secured capital. And I got to the board meeting and they shut the doors. It was like, okay, confidential, you know, because you know, we're listed, um, but we're raising 30 million. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it was around about that, and um, and it's like so, and we c we can see Australia is the growth engine of this business. Mm -hmm. So you can now hire thirty people. I was like, oh my god, <laughs> get some cleaners. <laughs> yeah, get a cleaner. Um, but um, but that was really exciting. Yeah. So you know, and then of course, zero famously over the next how many number of years raised four hundred and fifty million. Very unusual. And I know that now that was it was a bit of a bubble really mm. um, being in an organization that really had endless capital really if you could prove your KPIs you know customer acquisition costs and all the other SAS metrics um, spend as much as you want mm. because this is a land grab and that was really quite unique yeah um, and that's something I've learned outside of zero that that's an unusual scenario yeah. most startups are capital strapped mm. and you resource constrained um, zero wouldn't have that problem yeah and that that has some that has some trade-offs, mind you, because mm. you can, you know, whenever we had a problem, we typically would hire a lot of people to solve that problem yeah. rather than thinking through, how do we do that more efficiently? And I think that they're doing that now, but back in the day when you're in a hurry, um, you know, building systems or other things, you kind of, you're just going fast and hiring a lot of people. And, yeah, um, throwing and that, money at problems. Yeah, I mean, I like the fact that some of the startups I work with now, you really got to think through a problem. How do we solve this properly and efficiently? Mm. Um, you know, and um, I've got a couple of great examples that probably can't talk about, but where you step back and really look at your processes because you have limited capital mm. and you want to make Im make improvements. So it's about getting really down and understanding those things. And um, uh, and that's probably more the reality. M mind you, Zero did a lot of that, so don't get me wrong, but um, but it was a it was a unique scenario having pretty much unlimited capital. Yeah, amazing. I was curious, what, what's the thing you're most proud of from your time at Zero? Would you say if there's anything that stands out? Um, I'd say that, look a couple of things. I think I think just being involved and executing a vision that Rod shared with me. And the day I met him, he said to me, um, "We will be a household brand one day." Mm. 
And I'm sitting there going, I said to him, how can you say that? Like, we've got seven people, we've got like three, I think it's three and a half thousand customers in Australia. And, and it's one of the things I've got to know about entrepreneurs is just the, the really, the true entrepreneur is just has this undying belief about what they're doing. Yeah. Um, that can be a problem. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but I'm not an entrepreneur. I, I'm, I think I'm pretty good at spotting them, the good mm. ones. Um, but it was just occurred to me at that time, I was like, oh my God, this guy's just so clear in terms of what he wants to execute. And then to be on that journey and, um, and to build a meaningful business that is doing incredibly good things for the economy in small business, it's reinvigorated the accounting industry. Mm. Um, and it's, it's helped, like, I'm big on people and culture. So probably my proudest achievement, 2014, we were 15th best place to work. That took a lot of effort, but um, where that really hit home for me, September last year, I went to Xericon and um, I was representing Moolah, who I'm on the board, and, mm. and I like Xericon, it's a bit of a party, mm. and it was great to catch up with a lot of people, and I think xero has got some amazing staff, and, and just Steve's done a great job in building, building up a team of really, really talented and passionate executives, and um, I had a few people come up to me during that event and say, hey, thanks for giving me the opportunity, you changed my life. Wow. And that was really powerful for me, because if I reflect back, I used to get involved in just about every interview, I think out of the whole journey of those 270 I hired, I might have missed half a dozen interviews. And it wasn't that I was a control freak and it wasn't that I was, you know, um, spending, you know, a whole hour with them. In some cases, it was 10 minutes to go, hey, I'm Chris, I'm CEO, tell us a bit about yourself. You know, I'd share with them my vision about what we wanted to build and just get a bit to know to know them. Quite often they were shooting themselves because it was just, <laughs> if, if they were an admin or support role, I was like, why does the CEO want to meet me? But for me, it was two way. It was like, I'd always check to make sure that the people coming in were not just there to do a job and, and, and weren't, kind of just you know they were going to add to the culture yeah. but I think it also I wanted to send a message that I actually care about every person coming in the door so when I got that feedback at Xerocon in last year I thought yeah that, that's probably my proudest achievement was you know we, we changed lives we, we had we built a meaningful business you go to Xerocon now and look around and it's very hard for me not to kind of tear up a bit and go oh my god yeah because like, Rod and I used to joke about the fact that when tech ed because an event that I oversaw at Microsoft used to get 1200 people and Rod said to me when we first ran the first Xerocon in Australia, he goes, you know, wouldn't it be cool? Wouldn't it be cool one day if this was like bigger than tech ed? <laughs> and now I went to Xerocon, it's like 5,000 people. Yeah. It's insane. And it's like a rock concert. So <laughs> yeah, that, that's probably the proudest achievement, just seeing the impact of the brand and knowing that I was part of building that. So it's very cool. That's very cool. I love yeah. that. So why'd you end up eventually leaving Xero? What happened next for you? Yeah, look, um, that's a hard one in some senses. A lot of people ask me that and um, probably reflecting back on the Microsoft experience, I was really conscious about the inflection point in the journey with Zero at the point where I'd say time's up rather than dragging things out. Yeah. Um, and it was a really hard and emotional decision to leave. I remember ringing Rod and kind of being a bit teary about it. But, <coughs> um, you know, I said to Rod at that time, we'd just come off a, a leadership offsite and... I came away and I was having a beer with Trent Innes, who's now the CEO, and I hired Trent into Microsoft, uh, into Zero from Microsoft. He was re reporting to me, and I said to him, "You know, I probably don't have the fire in the belly like I used mm. to. Like the hard, the hard years are behind me. I'd been there five and a half years. It was, it was a challenging and, and very all-consuming role. Mm. You know, there was, um, uh, you know, I used to like it the fact that you know the the f the, the f last thing that would go through my mind when I went to sleep at night was zero and the <laughs> first thing that would come into my head in the morning was zero <laughs> so it was all consuming yeah. and I didn't mind that yeah but after five and a half years with with family and all the other things that was playing on my mind yeah. the fact that I went to this leadership offsite it was all about the next three years and I'm going I don't know I don't yeah. know whether the fire's there you know and I'd always say to my people you know we're building something special unique and it's an honor to be part of this so bring your best every day and enjoy the journey. And here's me going, I don't know if my heart's still in it. So even though I was really loyal and everything, so I just thought time's right yeah. for me to go. And, and I thought <clears throat> also there was a lot of exciting stuff going on. And I said to Rod, the exciting stuff with the business is for me not what's happening is next. It's what we did. <clears throat> mm. It's building, it's, it's making shit up and getting to the point. That was exciting. So the the attraction of getting involved in some other things and, and seeing and being part of that again. Yep. Um, and again, I, I probably, 
I'm probably the probably one thing I'd say is that I'm really good at sabotaging my own career. <laughs> I did it with Microsoft. You know, it's like when I left Microsoft, I was like, oh my god, what are you doing? You know, are oh, you you joining Google? And I went, no, I'm actually going surfing. But I was just <laughs> like, you know, I'm just because my next role was was safe. Zero would have been safe for me. I mean, there would have been yeah. a lot more. I would have you know learned a lot, and it would have been great. But I'm sitting there going, <clears throat> I, I want to try something else. Yeah. So that was the motivation, and you know, it was it was great and. The nice thing was as well that, you know, I can honestly say that the talent and the capability of that leadership team that I'd built was such that I could step away from that role. And you had someone like, the great thing was when they put Trent in to replace me, they could have gone out and the temptation would have been, let's go out and get a real heavy hitter, you know, ASX listed and, you know, someone. And I was like, no, 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 Trent gets it. Like people trust him. We're not that sort of business. Mm -hmm. So they hired Trent. I thought it was great. Uh, and he's done a fabulous job. In fact, I had lunch with him yesterday. We're reflecting on a lot of this sort of stuff. And, you know, so, um, so that, was, that was really it. It was, it was that sort of desire to go out and, and, and experience the early stage again. Yeah, I get that. It's almost like Zero was growing and becoming more of the oil tanker and you were craving like the speedboat again. <laughs> Correct. Oh, look, it was, well, it was, it was very much like the Microsoft scenario, yeah. right? It was becoming more of a corporate. It needed to. Yeah. And I, I was one of the ones saying to staff, we need systems, we need process, we need to implement more governance and things are going to change. And don't resist it because that's what happens. You know, that's the price of success. Things do need to, you need to implement more structure. It's not going to feel like the startup that we grew up with, right? Yeah. We're no longer a startup. Um, no apologies, guys. Yep. Um, but for me, it got to the point where I'm going, well, this is becoming a Microsoft awesome job done, right? Now we're becoming a corporate mm. and this is crazy success. Mm -hmm. But you know what? That's probably not where I want to be because I've been there and I stayed too long at Microsoft. So, so learning from that lesson was, no, jump ship now. Yep. Jump Makes back sense. into the speedboat. <laughs> I love it. So what did happen for you next? It uh, sounds like you got involved in some investing and some yeah. other projects. Is maybe you could just take us through the next stage of your career. Yeah, I mean, I mean, obviously, you know, the zero, the zero thing helped me financially. So I, I was looking at a number of gigs, and it was actually Rod who said to me, "Mate, don't jump in anything just yet. Just take your time." So I, 2016, I, I didn't take the year off, but I was very much just bouncing around on things and looking, uh, mm -hmm. doing a lot of reading, meeting a lot of tech entrepreneurs, and as you say, I invested in a few things, and, um, and I kind of learnt the model that worked for me, which was. Find stuff that you think's good, get to know the people, do some advisory as part of a due diligence process and mm. then decide if you want to invest. I did invest in something early on, sight unseen in the sense that I'd met the founder and had done a little bit of work, but <coughs> I probably jumped in too early. Mm. And that was a real lesson for me. I'm not going to mention names or anything, sure. but um, they're no longer around. And I didn't put much money in, but it did, it did confirm to me that, yeah, you've got to be better than that. You've got to really do due diligence. And then I... Yeah. So I learned a lot about, you know, understanding what was good, the founders, a whole lot of criteria that I'd applied to assessing technology to get involved in it. And I did that over 2016 and then one of the ones was my prosperity that I'd actually looked up because I just felt everything they were doing looked like zero for personal finances. Mm. <clears throat> and, um, and that was the one I ended up running that for a couple of years. <laughs> so Pete McCarthy, the founder, I looked him up and just said, hey, you know, I use your product, I love it. Um, but there's gaps and just really interested in what <laughs> you are planning to do and one thing led to another. But um, in the <laughs> he process... Would have loved getting, <coughs> was it? He would have loved getting <coughs> that email from you. <laughs> oh, it was, it was a funny funny story. But, um, but, you know, Sales Prezzo was part of that as well. Moolah, so, you know, Aris Alagos, who's running Moolah, doing very well. And, and that was very early stages. And, you know, again, all of these, there were lots of risks because they were quite mm -hmm. early stage startups. Yeah. Um, but what I really enjoyed was getting involved and helping... Um, mentor and and do some work with these startups which sort of took me back to the early days of zero yeah um, and it, you know reflecting on that early early stage startups there was a lot I got a lot of enjoyment out of getting involved and and not being the guy on point but actually helping the guy on point mm. so that was a real shift in my thinking was you know you don't necessarily need to run these things you can you can you know you can mentor and yeah. get involved without actually having to be the, the man on point although in the end, I did <laughs> I did put my hand up for the my prosperity CEO role, uh, yeah. which was which was a really interesting gig. So yeah, so that was literally you were a customer of my prosperity. Yep, <clears throat> and then you basically just saw that there's potential here, 
and some gaps as you said and you literally just reached out to the yeah account. i did i was <laughs> i was actually in a cafe and i as i'd often do just reading and i read this article pete mccarthy talking about my uh, my prosperity signing up an accountant every day or something and i thought oh sounds familiar account <laughs> an advisor but i was my my advisor when i was at zero put me onto my prosperity and i still use it it's fabulous right i mean mm. I still don't really understand why not every financial plan is on it. So mm. I'm a big believer in, in what they're doing. Unfortunately, Royal Commission recently has kind of, you know, thrown everything into mm. chaos. But but fundamentally, I think technology will prevail. And I think my prosperity is going to be a real winner. Mm. Um, but at that time, uh, I just said, you know, I really like what they're doing. And, and I, I like the fact that there was some really interesting people involved. You had Michael Happel, who was former PwC chairman. Shane Pettiona, who was one of the founders of car sales. And... COO and I thought these guys, you know I thought these guys are actually you know more serious than I thought I thought it was just an app yeah but then I realized a bit more than that so I sent Peter note out of the blue just hey you might know who I am ran zero I'm a customer but you know I've got some feedback and just love to know what you're doing and <laughs> and so I said and this is true Pete McCarthy form uh, sent the email and about three minutes later the phone rings he goes Chris Reed it's Pete McCarthy how you going so <laughs> met Pete an hour meeting went for like two and a half and I thought, shit, this guy is actually really gets it. Yeah. And so I started advising. I helped him um, raise capital. So Craig Winkler, number two shareholder in Zero, invested. Um, and um, and then I just got involved, starting to 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 advise and so forth. And then it was that summer of 2016, 17. Pete sort of turned around and said, "Do you want to do you want to get more involved in a more meaningful way?" I said, "What do you mean?" He goes, "Do you want to run it?" I said, oh, shit. <laughs> Um, so I, and I did that for a couple of years and it was fascinating it was hard it was actually I have to say it was harder than I thought wow. because um, because you know again you don't have un you don't have unlimited capital um, you're trying to really um, take financial planners on a journey um, unlike accounting where there's a real compliance need um, we were trying to find the must-have within the product um, and in many cases we found it so but what I realized that that, that there was a big difference between tech savvy, great financial planners and ones that aren't. Mm. Uh, yeah, so, and there was a lot of onboarding and a whole lot of challenges that came along the way. But I mean, still successful business, you know, 700 partners um, doing really well. Um, even, you know, despite the Royal Commission, um, I just think technology is going to be the, the way that we get through how advice the advice industry is transforming mm. um, but yeah, two years of that and then stepped away from that, joined the board um, yep. and then you know, again, getting involved in some, some different technology interests. Yeah, it's amazing. And so, yeah, you're involved in, a, got a lot of different projects at the moment. You mentioned yeah. before, like Moolah, Sales Prezzo, um, a few other companies that you're sort of advising at the yeah, moment. Yeah. I was just curious, have you, do you have any like criteria that you kind of use when you're looking at potential opportunities to either invest in or come on as an advisor? Do you have, I guess, like a mental checklist or just some criteria you have? Yeah, I do. Um, it's more than mental, it's actually written down in, Perfect. you know, engraved in <laughs> concrete, um, having learnt the hard way. Um, look, number one criteria for me is people. So um, I look for founders, entrepreneurs, people in and around that, not just the founders, but who they've brought onto the team that are kind of the must keep people that are gonna see through that journey. Uh, I look for the quality of those people, but you know, just the, the basic values of honesty, integrity, you know, passion and belief, um, you know, I look at um, all the founders I'm involved with. Um, they're all so different, but underpinning all of that are people that that I feel very comfortable. That if the shit hits the fan, you know, um, we're not going to we're not going to lose it. Mm -hmm. They're, you know, integrity is so important to me. You know, um, you meet a lot of. I'm not saying there's dishonest founders out there, but you do learn things when you start to do a bit of due diligence as to whether you know. Are these people that I really, you know, in the heat of the battle, fully trust? Yeah. Um, there's a whole lot of that stuff goes with it. But fundamentally, it's good people that I like, that I trust, that, that I really want to work with. At the end of the day, I can choose where I work now. I don't want to work with people that, you know, drive me nuts or are difficult or, you know, there's conflict or anything. I want to work with people where we get in and we do shit and it's fun, we're passionate about it and we can get to the end of the day and... You know, hopefully, I, I look at all of these these guys and girls that I work with, and you know, I have this sort of vision when when it's all said and done, and we know we're successful. Is just sitting down, having a beer or wine, and mm -hmm. just reflecting on how good it was, right? So that's first and foremost. Number two is 
It has to be technology I can get excited about. Mm. The amount of times I've looked at tech where it's like, yeah, okay, great founders, yeah, lots of really, really good people um, involved in it, but yeah, I don't, I don't know, I can't get excited about it. I'm not going to mention examples because that would be, you know, be, yeah, yeah. wouldn't be fair on, on some of the ones I've looked at. But look, clear, fair to say that I've said no more times than I've said yes, yep. like by a long way. And often it comes down to that, that one, which is I can see the potential of technology. Either I can't see the huge impact it's going to have. Like when I can see the impact, like my prosperity, when I looked at it, I went, yeah, get it. Mm. Totally get it. Like financial planners are making all these bloody investment decisions. They, they do not have the core data in real time. And that's what they do. It's like I can look at my phone at any time. I know my net worth. I've got everything in there. If I get hit by a bus, every piece of documentation, every, like just totally get it. Like yeah. could not, could not function without it from the point of view of just the risk alone. If anything happened to me, everything's in there, right? It's great. Um, Moolah, small business lending, right? Banks have shut up shop. It was obvious to me that capital and access to capital for small businesses and cash flow was going to become really, really important. Those guys are flying now on the back of banks really failing in that area. So again, I could see the impact that that was going to have and I could go on about all the others I'm involved in. But it's something that I have to get really passionate about. But, but I can deeply you know, get excited about what they're trying to solve. Um, so that's, that's number two. And then number three is a little selfish. <laughs> it's commercial upside for me. Yep, um, I can tell you a lot of great tech stories. There's one I'm actually meeting today. Again, I'm not gonna mention who, but awesome founder, uh, amazing technology um, that's done really, really well and very exciting. But the valuation's so racy mm. um, that you know, I could get involved, but I'm probably going to be spending the next couple of years really trying to justify that valuation. There was one mm -hmm. in particular, I remember back in 2016, I went to a startup event and there's this guy presenting and I'm going, this guy's really good. Like he's down to earth, he's just no bullshit, knows the domain, it's quite a unique domain. And I'm going, yeah, this guy's really good, he's really backable, I like him, you know. I'm on Twitter and I go, you know, such and such, you know, really refreshing to hear the no bullshit story and everything, blah, blah, blah. And then he got onto Twitter that night and said, oh, you at the event, let's catch up for a beer. We caught up for a beer. He said, why don't you come in, meet the board, we'll take you through what we're doing. Went in, the tech, I'm just going, holy crap, this is awesome, guys. So good. Mm -hmm. And then we had a couple of meetings and then, you know, the last minute, he said, hey, we'd love you to join the board, blah, 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 and, you know, perhaps invest. And then we'll, let's talk about valuation. It was like, and I'm not going to give you exact numbers, but it's, it's kind of like, you know, on on recurring revenue of 1.5 mil with guaranteed contracts of X, which in the end weren't guaranteed, <laughs> we're doing a pre-IPO round, pre round at 90 million. I'm going, what the fuck? Mm -hmm. Like I said, that's, like, that's crazy. I mean, great, <laughs> but the problem with that is the risk of a, a, you know, um, yep. a down round in the future is huge, unless you actually really nail those contracts and some. Yeah. So for me, it was like, Optimistic. yeah, I could get involved, but we're going to spend the next three years trying to justify that yeah. valuation. We'd be better off coming in at maybe 30 yeah. or even less. Like it was really racy and I just said no. Because yep. A, it was too risky. And I just, I thought it was silly, to be honest. Um, and secondly, you know, I'd rather get involved in something that's fair valuation, that's early stage. You know, there's others that I've been involved that I've looked at ASX list and go, eh, you know, you've just had come through 18 months, 400% growth in your share price. So, um, so yeah, love what you're doing, love founded, love everything else, but I'm probably not, not the right guy. So that's a bit of a selfish one, but you know, I'm gonna spend my time Makes in sense. areas that I can actually get return. And I look at, I literally run all the stuff I'm doing, I look at it as a fund and I track it, like, you know, how am I going in terms of the valuations and, you know, what return am I getting? So why would I spend a day a week in something that really is going to be difficult yeah. in two years to see it doing anything more than single digit growth or worst case going backwards yep so that's my criteria i love it <laughs> <laughs> make sure there's good people make sure you get the technology and make sure there's commercial upside yep. makes sense yeah it's cool i was curious as well so you've been involved in the startup ecosystem for a long time yep. um you seem to love it have you ever been tempted to start your own startup or you think your strengths lie in more like that growth phase and kind of advising and running. You, you know, you, you're going to expose my weakness here. No, not a chance. There's no way I would start anything. 
<laughs> no, um, and the reason I say that, it's just, um, firstly, I'm, I, I'm not an entrepreneur, right? I think I'm good at spotting them, mm. like I said earlier. But, um, but no, I don't, I'm good at, I, I'm good once, once an entrepreneur's got going and has, has got some level of market fit, even though it might not be perfect, is really, um, is really helping them on that scaling. You know, it's probably all the stuff I learned in my career of working for big companies. Yeah. Um, but equally, you know, um, post zero actually, I've learned as much post zero as I did in zero about startups and scale and, you know, you meet entrepreneurs with different skill sets and I learned from that. So, um, but fundamentally, I'd be too scared to start something. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I know it sounds really wimpy, but I think stick to your strengths. And so my strengths are, you know, finding good, good founders, helping them scale the business, um, getting my hands dirty in a lot of that. Like I, I do actually like rolling up my sleeves and doing that. anything yeah. from recruitment, even just building processes and all sorts of stuff. Um, but actually starting something from scratch, it's never really been my passion. Yep. And I think the other thing, seeing what it takes, yeah. I honestly don't think I have the energy or drive to do it. I mean, I look at the guys that, you know, like Aris is a great example at Moolah. Like those early days of building Moolah were hard, you know, um, Oh, this, this, it was tough. I was, I was going to say something. I'll probably speak out of school. But, you know, suffice to say, at the end of 2016, I remember ringing Aris, you know, um, just before Christmas, going, how you going, mate? And he's like, yeah. I mean, we were raising money at that time. It was hard because we were raising and just at the time we were out pitching to potential VCs, mm. the business just flatlined. It was like mm. growth just stopped. So we were doing the same numbers each month mm. and then potential investors were just leaving. I was yeah. like, you know, okay, well, obviously this is harder than you think it is um and you know we didn't have a lot of operating cash left and that's the reality of some of these businesses and so so that was tough and then you know we doubled down we got a great investor in acorn and um we started hiring and just you know i did actually jump in and, and roll the sleeves up a bit and help aris in a few areas and we got through that tough time but looking at the toll that takes and a lot of entrepreneurs go through that and sometimes don't come out the other side. Yeah. They're massive risks and I'm probably not the right person to do that, to be honest. Yeah. But working alongside them to help motivate, mentor and actually guide and help build, yep. that's something I think I'm good at. And yep. so we did it there and look, suffice, I'm happy to say Moolah today is really on a great trajectory and doing exceptionally well from those days, dark days, you know. Yeah, yeah. that's cool. And that's the thing, it's, that's your strength, that's your where you can apply yourself and get the best results. So it makes perfect sense to, to help with that growth stage. So yeah. totally get it. Yeah. Cool. So we're sort of coming up towards the end of the interview here, Chris, but just a few quick questions just to tie us out. Yep. Just wondering if you've got a favorite book or something, a resource that's really helped you um, over the years. Probably my favorite book would be by Patrick Leanchoni. This is a question without notice, by the way, so you should <laughs> ask me. Um, is Five Dysfunctions of a Team. It was a book that um, Vamos made us read back uh, in the Microsoft days. And the thing I like about that book is it's a fable about a dysfunctional team and looks at the, the, the five attributes that, you know, that causes a team to be dysfunctional. And I like it because it's not coming from the point of view of this is how to build a successful team. This is what a shit team looks like. <laughs> Don't be that. Wow. And so I've actually um, provided that book to a lot of CEOs that I mentor um, because it's all about building good cultures you know, transparent cultures, cultures where people aren't afraid of conflict. Conflict mm -hmm. can be good if it's managed well. Mm -hmm. You know, attention to detail, you know, not over, just sort of brushing over detail, you know, being those sorts of things which are, are so important if you're building a functional leadership team mm -hmm. uh, because ultimately it comes down to trust. Yeah. Like if you've got, and that was the thing I would say about Zero was that ultimately, I remember sitting in this room, um, we're in my little pool room, and s looking around the table, at the time that I had resigned, thinking, you know what, this is the best team I've worked in. You know, I literally, these are some of the best people I've worked with. I trust them implicitly. There's great camaraderie. Everyone's got each other's back. You know, we are running 100 miles an hour and no one feels uncomfortable. We can talk about anything, mm -hmm. you know, both professionally and personally, knowing that we're going to get full support. Like it was really, really highly functioning team. And a lot of it came down to, you know, ensuring that those functional aspects about, you know, all the things within that book, um, we'd kind of nailed. So I, I would suggest, you know, if you're scaling and building a, 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 a team, um, it's a really good read. Awesome. It's on the list now. Yep. 
And <coughs> what's coming up for you in 2020? We're sort of at the start of the year here. What's the rest of the year look like? Well, we were talking about it before I jumped on the podcast, but last year was an, a unique year because I, I took most of the year off and I built a house um, <laughs> down the coast, which was amazing. You talk about building businesses, building a house is um, very different, but there's yeah. some similarities, you know, it can be quite lonely. <laughs> <laughs> you hit challenges, um, but it's also really rewarding when, when you actually get it to the point where, um, where it's all finished. So that was fabulous that was 2019 and that was just a buck a, a strange bucket list item to actually get on the tools and actually build something uh so that was great so um i got to the end of last year we got the house done stayed in there realized i'm not going to make money out of being a tradie <laughs> so uh, i'm back in tech um <clears throat> i'm on a few boards i'm doing some advisory work um i've got a couple of other things brewing um, i'm pretty much going to go back to full time but running it really as my own sort of consulting business. But like I mentioned before, <clears throat> you know, uh, I look at everything I do is like a, a fund and I'm looking at return. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, so part of that is looking at how I can build increased value, values of businesses I'm involved in. And a lot of that comes down to me getting involved and advising them as well. Yep. Uh, and then there's some really sort of bespoke stuff on the side that I do and charge fees and things like that. So, so it's gonna be a busy year, but I guess underpinning all that is my passion for tech. Mm -hmm. and particularly tech in this part of the world and in Melbourne in particular. It, with the exception of one company up in Sydney, Quali, um, all the other companies I get involved in are Melbourne-based tech companies. And, you know, I guess my secret ambition would be I'd love to see one or two or three of them pop up and be the next zero. Yeah. Uh, that's hard, right? I mean, zero is unique. I, I accept the fact that having one of those in your career <laughs> is probably enough. Um, but I'm greedy. And so I'd love, love to, uh, for various reasons, not just financial gain, but also just the thrill of seeing something meaningful that has impact in the domain uh, that you can build something and also validate the fact that there's bloody good tech coming from this part of the world. We've got incredible mm. talent. And I get excited about seeing ideas spawn from Melbourne in particular and become competitive globally and mm. hopefully some of the tech I'm involved in now uh, will continue and and prove that that's actually true. Love it. And Sounds like it. a busy year. <laughs> Going to be a great year. Very excited. Awesome. And is there anything I haven't asked you or just anything you want to make sure you pass on to the audience? There's heaps you haven't asked me, but I, I mean, I think we've had, had it done enough. Um, <laughs> no, look, I, I think that that's that's pretty much me, you know. Um, the, the, the tip that I would give people listening, and, and I know you're going to have a mix of audience, you're going to have entrepreneurs that are, are kind of doing it from scratch and others in the corporate world. And I think, um, I think I like to encourage people that are in corporate to kind of follow the path I've followed. Um, you know, if you're sitting in corporate, don't under underestimate the skills, experience and impact that you can have on a, on a startup. So combining, because there's a lot of entrepreneurs out there that have got really, really good intuitive gut feel kind of, um, skills mm -hmm. to build a business but they lack a lot of the, the rigor the discipline and other issues around scale so I'd love to see more and I think we're seeing it more people jumping out of corporate and opting to jump into startups it's not without its risks mm -hmm. you know you can't just walk into a startup and say I'd like to have five percent of your company mm -hmm. let's go that's bullshit that doesn't <laughs> happen you have to prove yourself and you have to take a pay cut you know a lot of people say to me oh I'd love to do what you did I'm going okay well let's start from the beginning you happy to take a 50% pay cut no fucking way <laughs> well forget it like yeah. you know it's just a reality they can't pay those sorts of ways so there's there, there are natural forces that mean that those things aren't easy but um, but I'd really encourage people to think about taking that punt because you're only in the planet once so have a crack and it might just work out love it great advice so what's the best way for people to connect with you, Chris? Or if they want to see what you're up to, is there a specific LinkedIn's way? probably the easiest way to connect, yeah. Cool. Chris Reed on LinkedIn. Well, cool. amazing career you've had, Chris. You've done some amazing things, worked with some interesting companies and had some amazing journeys on those speedboats. So really appreciate <laughs> you coming on the show today and sharing Thanks, your knowledge. So thank you very much. Thank you. Cheers.